In this video, we're going to be discussing Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. And we're going to be looking at how the viscosities of each of those compare. There's actually a number of different non-Newtonian fluids that we're going to be discussing during this video. But to begin with, it's worth recapping what we mean by viscosity. So as we said in an earlier video, the viscosity of a fluid is best thought of as the thickness or the resistance to flow for that fluid. We have an animation on the right hand side which compares a low viscosity fluid such as water with a much higher viscosity fluid such as oil. We introduced two different types of viscosity. We discussed dynamic viscosity represented by the Greek letter mu and we also discussed kinematic viscosity, which is the dynamic viscosity per unit density. But in this video, we're going to focus on the dynamic viscosity. We saw how dynamic viscosity can be found by dividing the shear stress acting on the fluid by the shear rate of the fluid. And we related this to two plates separated by a fluid where the top plate was moving and the lower plate was fixed. Just for completeness, we saw that shear stress was the force being applied to the top plate divided by the area in contact with the fluid for that plate. And we saw that the shear rate was the velocity of the top plate divided by the separation distance between the two plates. We then went on to discuss that if the dynamic viscosity increases, then the force that needs to be applied in order to maintain the same velocity also increases. Or vice versa, if the dynamic viscosity increases and the force remains the same, then the velocity of that top plate must decrease. So we saw these relationships between viscosity, the shear stress on the fluid, and the shear rate of the fluid. So this is a useful starting point for understanding the differences between Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. Pictured on the screen here, we have some axes, and on the y-axis we have shear stress, tor, measured in pascals. And on the x-axis we have shear rate, gamma dot, in seconds to the minus one. Now the reason why plotting different fluids on these axes is useful is because, as we mentioned, dynamic viscosity is shear stress over shear rate. Well, if we do shear stress on the y-axis, divided by shear rate on the x-axis, what we're actually referring to there is the gradient of a graph. Gradient is change in y over change in x. So when we plot these different fluids on this graph, it's the gradient of the graph that represents the dynamic viscosity. So I'll just add a note in the bottom right-hand corner, the gradient is the dynamic viscosity, and this is something that we need to consider as we look at each of these fluids. So first of all then, we have our Newtonian fluids. And Newtonian fluids obey a very simple rule. Basically, a Newtonian fluid has constant dynamic viscosity. So what that means is if we increase the shear stress that we're applying to the fluid, then the shear rate increases in proportion. Or thought of another way, if we double the force on the top plate in the model we saw previously, then we would double the velocity providing the separation distance remained the same. The important thing to remember is that a Newtonian fluid has constant dynamic viscosity, providing the temperature and other parameters remain constant. We'll discuss the effects of temperature again in a moment. So next we have a Bingham plastic. What we notice is that a Bingham plastic also has constant viscosity, but what we notice is that the shear stress, shear rate graph doesn't go through the origin. Let's take a moment to think about what that means. What it means is that it takes a certain amount of shear stress here before the fluid yields and begins to behave or flow like a fluid. So we need to apply stress and up to a certain stress level indicated by the intersection with the y-axis the fluid doesn't flow, it behaves like a solid. And then when we reach that stress value, the fluid begins to flow like a Newtonian fluid. It has constant dynamic viscosity. An example of a Bingham plastic fluid is something like toothpaste, where it takes a certain amount of stress for the fluid to yield, and then once it yields, it behaves like a fluid. 
So the terminology that we use here is that the fluid needs to yield before it begins to flow. Next we have our dilatant fluids. So what we see here is that the dilatant fluid doesn't have constant dynamic viscosity. In fact, the gradient of the graph increases as the applied shear stress increases. Now dilatant fluids are what's known as shear thickening. And the reason they're called shear thickening is because as we apply more shear stress, the viscosity increases or they become thicker. They become more resistant to flow the more stress we apply. So dilatant fluids are referred to as shear thickening fluids. An example of a dilatant would be wet sand. If you stand in one position and your shear rate is low, then you'll begin to sink. However, if you step on the sand, which will increase the shear rate, then the viscosity of the wet sand actually increases. It provides more resistance against your feet. Next, we have a pseudoplastic. Now pseudoplastics are the opposite of a dilatant. They don't have constant viscosity, but what we see is they become thinner or less viscous as the shear stress increases. These are known as shear thinning fluids because they become thinner as the shear stress and shear rate increase. An example from the food industry would be something like ketchup. If you visualize an upturned ketchup bottle, it takes a certain amount of time for the fluid to begin to flow but once it begins to flow, it flows much more freely. That's because it's a shear thinning fluid. Now, the last type to consider is a combination of both the Bingham plastic and the pseudoplastic, and it's known as a Bingham pseudoplastic, represented on our graph by E. What we notice here is the behavior is very similar to a pseudoplastic in that it's shear thinning, but similar to the Bingham plastic, what we have is this yield point. So a Bingham pseudoplastic takes a certain amount of stress before it yields. Once it yields, it begins to flow. And if we continue to increase the shear stress level on that fluid, then it actually starts to thin, meaning that it flows more easily at higher stress levels. So finally, it is worth mentioning how changes in temperature would affect each of these fluids. We know from previous tutorials that the viscosity of a Newtonian fluid decreases as temperature increases, and we saw this in our Redwood experiment. Well, the same is actually true for all of these fluids. When we increase temperature, we increase the activity of the particles in that fluid, and therefore we decrease the viscosity. If we consider how that would affect each of these traces, a decrease in viscosity would be represented by a decrease in gradient. So what we would see for all of these traces is a tipping downwards in this direction. Essentially the fluids would be less resistant to flow, therefore the shear rate would increase more rapidly with increases in shear stress. So to summarise, in this video we've revisited what we mean by the viscosity of a fluid. We've then used what we've learned to compare different types of fluids, both Newtonian and non-Newtonian. And we've looked at four different classifications of non-Newtonian fluid. Bingham plastics, which need to yield before they flow like a fluid. Dilatants, which are shear thickening fluids. Pseudoplastics, which are shear thinning fluids. And finally, Bingham pseudoplastics, which are a combination of both Bingham plastics and pseudoplastics. And then finally, we've discussed how temperature would affect each of these plots of shear stress against shear rate for various different Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids.